Well, welcome, new friend of the headwaters, uh, Sapuka Wietz, Sierra Green. Uh, welcome, 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 Sierra. And Sarah's going to share a story with us. Sierra is going to help. Uh, is going to share a story with us. It helps us think a little bit about the, what's fully embedded in that word "land" when we talk about land back. Um, Sapu Kao Wietz has a Master of Science from Portland State University and is on the faculty of the Native American Science Program at Northwestern India College, Indian College. Please join me in welcoming Sapu Kao Wietz. Great. Thank you so much. And I appreciate you for attempting to pronounce my name. A lot of times <laughs> people would just be like, I don't know how, and so they won't. And so, Sapokas Wheatis. Ina Monikwa Sapokas Wheatis, Kasleapotipki, Sierra Green, Ka Inuas, Nimipu, Kasleapo. What I did was introduce myself in my language. Sapokas Wheatis, as you can see on the screen, means thing that causes survival. I'm Nimipu and also Soyapo. And so, on my mother's side, I have German, Irish, and Scottish descent. And I just put up here a phrase, besides the beautiful landscape, um, over in Oregon, looking at the Wallawa Mountains just above uh, Wallawa Lake, I put my own personal mission. And I'm not sure if everybody in the room has a personal mission. Um, you know, the schools typically have a mission, agencies have a mission, but I encourage you to think about what is your mission, your personal mission. And so for me, my name, Sapolka Suitis, means thing that causes survival. And that's a very, uh, a name that carries a lot of responsibility, as do all of our names. But that one's very direct, thing that causes survival. And when I came to have that name, I wanted to be sure that all the things that I do are aligned with who I am, who I'm supposed to be, what is my purpose. And so I came up with this mission that says promoting the protection and healing of our communities and homelands through culture, science, and education. So I hope today I can share a little bit about my perspectives on land, the land acknowledgements, land back, uh, because that's where I come from. And it would only be appropriate if I began with a land acknowledgement myself. Today, I'm tuning in uh, from Albuquerque which is the home of 23, probably more, tribes, 19 of which are Pueblos, three of which are Apache tribes, and of course the Navajo or the Diné people. For me, um, where I teach and work, typically, I'm just down here on a work for a work meeting, um, is back home in Idaho, in Lapway and Lewiston, Idaho is where I reside. And Northwest Indian College, the campus that I'm uh, situated at, is located in Lapway. And I came to understand that our college didn't have a land acknowledgement itself. And so I developed one for my own syllabi to share and kind of found, you know, give our, give our class and our courses and our scholars foundation at the beginning of each quarter and revisiting it throughout the quarter to ensure that we're staying connected to the land. So I'll read it here, uh, you can read along. Related to the Northwest Indian College mission of supporting and fostering learning through the generations and dissemination of knowledge, we acknowledge that the land of the Nespers site campus is on the lands from which the Nimipu or Nespers people come from in the past, present and future. We acknowledge the entirety of history of this place and honor with gratitude the land itself for taking care of the human and non-human relations since time immemorial. And I love this picture here, these two pictures. Uh, the one on the left is at the same place um, in out towards McCall, Idaho. Tuxpolisnema is the name of the place in our language, means place of the beaver. And it's a place my family goes fishing every summer. There was a span of time where we didn't go. It was too hard for my dad and my aunts and uncles to go there without their father. And over time, we begin to go back and the salmon are still there uh, to, to uh, greet us when we arrive. The little girl on the left hand side here is my Auntie Bridget, and she just turned 50 recently. So you can kind of, you know, ballpark the age of that photo. On this right hand side, um, 
these are all these kids are all growing up now. This uh, young man here holding the end of this heavy pole is a senior in high school. And, you know, he was maybe uh, 12 or so in this picture. And so it's a it's a place. It's a place that harnesses so much uh, emotion, evokes so much emotion, comfort, happiness, memories and traditions, food, medicine. A nourishment, you know, not just for our mind and our body, but our spirit as well. And so I'll tell you a little bit about, I know a lot of people can understand, you know, oh, we come from the land of what we eat, or, you know, we drink the water that's been on this earth for thousands and millions of years. And we can all understand we come from this land. But for me, coming from this land means so much more. And of course, there's the story for that. On this left-hand side, this map, it shows uh, the homelands of the Nimipu people. This dark tan here is the Columbia River Basin. The blue river that we see here is the Columbia River. This one that comes through Lewiston, where I uh, reside, and goes down over here. It starts in actually uh, just outside Jackson Hole, Wyoming, is the Snake River. In this light green area, is what we refer to as the 1855 Indian Claims Commission uh, territory in which we were placed upon, 1855, not that long ago, after residing upon this area for tens of thousands of years. In 1863, another treaty was signed and our, our reservation we were forced onto was diminished to this dark green area. And so from the 19 million acres down to the 750,000 acres, our home base has diminished 90%, our homelands. That doesn't quite stop us. Luckily, our ancestors had the foresight to say, we may be forced onto this small piece of land, this small partial of land, but we reserve the rights to go hunt and fish and gather all across our homelands. And so luckily for me, right, my family, where we hunt and fish and gather is down here. It's not in our reservation territory. It's not even in the 1855 necessarily all the time. We travel all throughout the northern states to hunt and fish and gather and practice our culture and our traditions, make memories, be nourished mentally, physically, and spiritually. But why do I say we come from the land besides we eat the food and drink the water and all the things? We breathe the air. We are warmed by the fire. The story begins, in the way we start our stories, is Wakipa, means a long time ago. There was this big monster, and you can see this beautiful rendition from a kindergarten student who heard the story I told once about 10 years ago. And there was this great monster that was swallowing all the animals. It had swallowed all the birds. It had swallowed up all the fish out of the water, all the insects all the mountain animals, all the prairie animals. Only one that was left was Talipa, fox, and Itziaya, coyote. Itziaya was up frolicking on the hillside doing who knows what. Reminder, that's coyote. And Talipa comes running up. Itziaya, there's a monster, and he has eaten everybody. He has eaten all the fish, all the winged relatives, all the four-leggeds. All of all the animals have disappeared. They have been swallowed by this monster. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, let's go check it out. And so they go back down to the hillside. And sure enough, they see this big swallowing monster. And before you know it, before they can even stop themselves as they trot towards the monster, a large gust of wind comes from the monster sucking in large quantities of air. And in that large suck that it was doing as they approached, Talipa fox got swallowed up as well. That left just it's yeah, yeah, coyote. And he looked around and he said, well, sure enough, there's no winged relatives. He looked in the creek. And sure enough, there's no water relatives. There's no finned relatives. Looked up to the hillsides. Looked over to the prairies. No four-leggeds either. They must all be in that monster's belly. And so he thought for a minute, what shall I do? And again, he looked to the winged relatives. Well, they make nests. Maybe I'll make a rope so I can tie myself to some of the sacred mountains 
to hold me in place so that monster doesn't swallow me up. So he fashioned him, fashioned him up, himself up some ropes. He also looked down to the water and he thought about beaver. And beaver is related to fire. And so he said, okay, well, I'm going to get all my fire making uh, materials together and I'll bring those with me. Have them with me. I don't know what's going to happen. Then he looked to the mountains and the hillsides and he thought, ooh, grizzly bear has those big, sharp claws. I'm going to make me some knives so I can be protected if I need to. So he got inspiration from all the animals to gather himself a, a kit to take on this monster. And he begins to taunt the monster and yell at him, hey, monster. I'm sure you can't follow me up like you have everyone else. And this angered, angered the monster. He was already upset, and that's why he was swallowing up all the animals. After some time, he begins to suck, and they, uh, it's Yaya says, well, let's have a swallowing contest. I will swallow you before you can swallow me. So they're taking these big gusts of air into their lungs back and forth. And every time the monster is getting more furious and sucking harder, Coyote's ropes are starting to get tight and he's flying in the in the air like a kite. And it comes to a point where he said, well, I made my ropes so good. They're never going to break from these sacred mountains I've tied myself to. And so he takes one of those knives and he cuts the rope and gets swallowed into the monster. If you know any coyote stories, now you know all the animals that were inside the belly might not have been so pleased to see Itziaya. Many were like, oh, you're here, now what? Now what's going to happen? We thought it was bad, now it's only going to get worse. A lot of naysayers, a lot of not, not uh, Itziaya supporters. Very few were. Talipa Fox is one that tolerated him probably the most. But many of the others uh, didn't didn't quite look to Coyote as a, a pleasantry. Upon his arrival, he said, I'm here. I'm going to help everyone get out. That's why I came in, because there's no way I can do anything out there. The monster and I were just sucking air back and forth. There's no way I could swallow the monster. And the monster surely couldn't swallow me unless I cut my rope. And so he says, well, I brought in some fire making tools. I'm going to make a fire and maybe we can smoke out the monster and burn it from inside out. So some of the animals, of course, say, yeah, that's not a bad idea. It's yeah, yeah. And, and begin to think, you know, maybe he's on to something. Give him a little bit of the benefit of the doubt. Some still were like, coyote's a waste of time. It's yeah, yeah. I don't even know why he tries. <laughs> and so it's yeah, yeah, begins to make a fire. And sure enough, the monster starts to cough cough out some of uh, the birds. They're able to fly and escape. Well, they see it's yeah, yeah, on that belly of the monster. They're not flying back to help. They're getting as far away as possible. But sure enough, the fire goes out. He could only carry so much with him to keep the fire going. And so, of course, the, the heckling of it's yeah, yeah, persists. Coyote, you always make things worse. You just, uh, you know, we never believe in you because you never do anything right and so on and so forth. And it's Yaya says, wait, you guys, I have some knives. Maybe I can cut our way out of here. And so he begins to cut away at the heart of the monster. Again, he could only bring in so many knives with him. You know, it's Yaya doesn't have too many pockets in his fern. And so he begins to cut away at the heart of the monster. And he's making progress. And then his knife breaks. And, of course, the naysayers start going at him again. He said, just wait, I have another knife. So he starts to cut away again, and he's making more progress, more progress. Well, that flint knife breaks as well. And so more, you know, heckling him and degrading him and demeaning him and bringing up all these memories. This is just like that time you did this. and You remember that time you did that? This is going to be the same way. And so he says, wait, this is the last knife I have. This is my last resort. If I can't get us out of here now, I don't know what's going to happen. And so let everybody kind of paused and said, well, you know, maybe if you cut it like this, it's yeah, yeah. Don't do it like that so much. Use this technique. That's what I use with my sharp claws. And so they begin to encourage him. And it's yeah, yeah kind of got confidence again and not that he ever lacked it very much, but he got a little bit more confidence. And now with a little bit more input, he was 
able to say, okay, I'm going to cut away and I'm going to use this method and this strategy. As he's cutting away at the heart and cutting away at the heart, it begins to tear and tear and tear. And as it's getting close to dropping from the other tissue within the monster, he tells everyone, go to the exits. If you are a hunter, you know that when something dies, the openings all open up. And so everybody went to the different exits and waited. And as he made that final cut and the heart dropped out of the uh, monster's tissue, all the openings opened up and the animals were all able to escape. Once they got out, they were all happy, but at the same time, like, we're getting out of here before something worse happens. They flew back into the air and they went back into the water and up into the mountains and hillsides on the prairie. And who was left there? But it's Yaya and Tulipa. And so it's Yaya being as proud as he always can be of himself was real, you know, his chest puffed up and he was just so proud. Look at what I did. And Tulipa was like, well, it's yeah, yeah, this is, um, you know, we're not supposed to waste anything if we kill it. So what are you going to do with this big giant monster? And it's yeah, yeah, said, I was getting to that, which he wasn't, but he always, you know, always yeah. knew what he was doing. And so he said, I'm going to cut up this monster and throw the pieces of it across the landscape. And where those pieces land, there will be people that come to be. There will be two legged that come to be. And so he did that. He cut off pieces and threw it to the east and to the west and to the north and to the south and created areas where people would come from. And he was real proud of himself again. And Tulipa said, well, it's yeah, yeah. That's good. I'm glad you did that. That was real smart of you to do and think of. But what about this place? And where they were at at the time was along the Clearwater River, up where up where uh, is now known as Kamii, Idaho. And it's yeah, yeah, went over to the water, to the Clearwater River, and washed his hands, and took the heart that was left there and dripped the blood onto the land. And he said, "Right here will be the Nimipu people. They'll come from this place. They'll be strong and they'll be smart. They'll be wise and they'll take care of this place." They'll be friendly and hospitable. They'll and continue to name all these characteristics of the Nimipu people. And still to this day, the heart sits along Highway 12 and can be seen and visited and appreciated. And every time I have the fortune of driving by, I always stop over here at the pullout and say a prayer and a blessing and honor this place that I come from. And so when I say I come from this land, it's not only, again, the nourishment of the food that we eat and the water that we drink, the air that we breathe, the fire that warms us, but it's this story that still has a place on the landscape to remind us of where we are, who we are, and where we come from. And I share that story because we come from this land. All of us come from this land, whether we have a landmark to showcase it or not. And for me, you know, land acknowledgements um, often honor the people. You know, this land belonged to X and Y tribes. And I'm not saying that's incorrect or wrong. And I know I was listening in on a lot of the land back discussions earlier, and I have nothing to refute that great discussion that already occurred. But to me, a lot of time when I hear land acknowledgements or land back um it's very much so about ownership and if you recognize in the land acknowledgement i gave for our college it's not saying this is the land of the nest Perce people it said this is the land in which the nest Perce come from the name who come from this place you know the land has taken care of us for thousands of years that's really what it is and I always think about this as another one of our stories, uh, Ant and the Yellow Jacket. And these two, Ant and the Yellow Jacket, were fighting over a piece of salmon. Just right there along the Clearwater River as well, but closer down to the Snake River confluence. They're over there fighting over a piece of salmon. And it's Yaya, Coyote, said, hey, you guys stop fighting over salmon. There's plenty of salmon in the river. But they both wanted to eat the salmon at this place, on this rock. 
And so back and forth, they fought and argued about it. And so he turned them to stone. And they still stand there today to remind us about being greedy, about being possessive of things. And I think about that when I think about land acknowledgements and land back. You know, in acknowledging the land, are we acknowledging the people or are we acknowledging the land? It's not people acknowledgement, it's land acknowledgement. But that's not to dismiss the thousands of years of relationship in which the indigenous people have had with the land. Okay, so it, it is intricately woven and it can't be separated one from the other. And that's the biggest thing that I see is people trying to say the people over here are different than the people over there, which is true. But in the grand scheme of the land taking care of us, human and non-human, it's, it's, it's very much the same. And so I really struggle with some of the um, land ownership uh, conversations. And I love those. Um, you are on native land hats, right? I'm sure everybody has seen them. Um, they're uh, produced by Urban Native. I have a couple myself. The tote bag, the pin, I've got it all gifted to me. And I love it. I love wearing it because I had this one lady say, oh, uh, where's where's your hat referring to? And I'm like, well, where we're at today is actually the homelands of the Coeur Lane people. But where I'm from, it's the homelands of the Nimupu people. And we share a lot of land. It was a great talking point, right? That's the whole purpose of these. But again, it's not the native land as a possession. It's the native land as a uh, responsibility to of where we come from. And the land itself is native. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the definition of what uh, native is, right? It has come from this place. So I always love this quote that my father would say for years when I was growing up, and I didn't really appreciate it um, until now, until I became older. I moved some of this out the way. Um, and it says, I belong to the land out of which I came. Earth is my mother. Who was a, he was one of our chiefs in uh, the 1800s, late 1800s. I belong to the land out of which I came. Earth is my mother. Now, there's nothing possessive about that besides I belong to, not I'm an owner of, or I possess this. It's really something to think about when we think about land acknowledgements. We come from. I see some in the chat. Is there? I'm going to check this real quick. Okay, great. Thanks for posting those links. Um. Yeah. So you know, it's it's an origination statement, not a possession statement. We originate from this place. We don't possess it. And I really like this quote from Dan Wildcat in Power and Place. If you haven't read it, it's a great read. Um, Dan, Daniel Wildcat and uh, Vine Deloria uh, wrote this book, Power and Place. And it's not enough to simply collect oral histories, study the language, learn the tool making procedures, and know the arts and crafts of our indigenous societies. All of this being done, which many of you are doing as we speak in institutions or connecting to the culture, all of these ought to be done, but we must ex explore experientially living in the world. We can sit in, on Zoom like we are right now, and we can read all the textbooks and beautifully written things like Braiding Sweetgrass, but until we personally go out and put our feet on the soil, breathe in the cold, crisp air where you all are at today, see the beauty of the double rainbow over so many sacred sites right here and stories. You know, we're, we're not doing it. We aren't exploring experientially living in the world. And it's that spiritual connection that some of you may say you're not spiritual. You may not, um, you know, belong to any religious entity or anything like that, but you feel when you see something like this, you know it's beautiful. You feel that beauty, you know, and that's that's spirit. You know, there's spirit all around us all the time. And I bring this up. Um, I bring up this image here because there was a time, and it's actually in this picture. Over here, you can see these big boulders on the landscape. 
And some may say those are remnants from uh, the Missoula flood left across the landscape. But our stories tell us that this was of the time when there was a great council. The animals all came together for a great council. And Coyote was running this council and he said, there's going to be this new animal coming and they're going to be naked and they're not even going to know how to live and we all need to help them. And so one by one, the animals stepped forward, the deer stepped forward and said, they can use my coat for clothing. They can use my antlers as tools. The salmon and all the fish came forward and said, they can eat me for nourishment. They can use the slime across my skin for glue. Every single animal came forward and was classified and qualified for what their purpose was going to be, how they were going to help these naked, clueless people coming, the two-legged. They came forward and they said this, and they said how they will be, where they will be, when they will be there, when they will be useful, when they will be going through their life cycles, and how is that going to help these, these clueless humans that are going to be coming soon. And so it brings forth, you know, that responsibility that we have to these animals and above all to the places in which they reside, in which they are going to come from, in which they need to survive, to continue to provide us with the nutrients we need, with the clothing we need, with the tools we need for our survival. So it was an agreement made on that day, the original treaty between the people and the animals. And it was before the people came that this was already set in place when the humans arrived. And like I said, it's about getting out there and connecting to the things. There's so many messages right here when we go out. We Again, we can sit here and read the books and I, I teach ecology and we get into all the depths of soil science and the water cycle and the hydrological features across the Northwest, especially in our beautiful rivers that we have. But what I like to do is take people out, take them out to go fishing, take them out to go hunting, to take care of the hides, to experience the smells. There's a certain smell when you go hunting. There's a certain feel to the, to the ground, to the air when the elk are in rut. That's not something you can learn out of a textbook. And that's definitely not something you can capture in a land acknowledgement. But you yourself can take time to acknowledge the land. Every single day, every single moment. Take the kids out. Take your nieces and nephew out. Go out birding with the Audubon Society. Go do the things that you can feel. And not always just the things you can read. And I know other professors might be like, they need to be reading. But I agree. And... I can teach anyone the water cycle, but if you don't know how to feel the water or feel the storms coming or look at the clouds and know what's going to happen, you know, how much do you really know? I want to play this short video. Hopefully, I don't know if you guys did my audio right on my shirt. One second. Hopefully this will be okay. It might not be great. We'll see. No, it's not going to let me, um, since it's on Google Slides. There's a great video called From the Heart, or Of One Heart, that the Nimi Pro produced, and it shares about our connection to the land and where we are and where we come from. So acknowledging the land. For me, again, when I moved back home after getting my master's, how can I help others see the land, connect to the land, understand where they come from? Well, no better way than take them out and do the things. And also learn about the career pathways of it, the academic research you can do as part of it. Learning about condors, but also looking at our ancient um, artifacts and our tools, visiting places like the Weiss Rock Shelter, um, you know, 6,000 year, 6, years data back. Our ancient relative Lamprey, going to visit him at the, at the hatchery, going whitewater rafting on the Salmon River talking with water resources to see the headwaters of where the water from uh, Lapway Creek comes from. 
and continuing to do these things, going to our sacred hot springs, talking with the Forest Service at Muscleshell Meadows, where Lewis and Clark first encountered the Nimi Pru, but had been beautifully maintained for thousands of years in the camas fields, supporting families to go out and harvest buffalo together at a place they had never been, getting their first kill. These type of memories you can only make when you go out and do the things and make that connection to the land, the land that we all come from. When And many of you may be in a place where you weren't born and raised. I went to school in Flagstaff, Arizona. Well, I didn't just say, well, I'm not from here, so I can't have a connection. There's beautiful San Francisco peaks that's uh, sacred to so many of the tribes in the Southwest that I now have a connection with going out and spending time with. All across Arizona, Antelope Canyon, down to Sedona, in the beautiful snow of uh, Flagstaff Mountains. And this is here on the top of San Francisco Peaks. And understanding what's important here, protect sacred sites, defend the sacred. This is something that I had to learn because I didn't know anything about Arizona when I moved there. But I made that point to make that connection to the place, to acknowledge the land upon which I was on in which many people come from. I'm going back home and protecting our homelands. Moving to Portland and finding beautiful things like this whole uh, clutch of eggs from a, uh, I'm not even sure which, which bird. Or finding this tiny salamander in waste that we are picking up out of one of the wetlands. Or looking at camas seeds and taking count. Beautiful mentors along the way to teach me how to see and appreciate the land, not only from which I come from, but wherever I'm at. And making sure that classes that I took in college got me out on the land. This is a fire and forestry class that I took while at Fort Lipson University. And always returning back home to collect our medicines and feed my dog the bones of our, of our four-legged relatives. I share all this um, to help you all reflect on who's your friends, who's your relatives, whether you be in the beautiful mountains that you guys are at today, or you return home and it may be Oceanside, it may be on the on, in the desert or up on the prairies. You know, all around us, there's these beautiful things to learn from beautiful people to learn from. My grandma Geneva, would you need to dig the roots so we can eat beautiful meals like this with moose and all of the celery, onions, and our Indian potatoes gathered from the land. And it all just comes back to remind us, you know, acknowledge the land itself. Yes, the people are important, but we would be nothing without the land. We come from the land. It's um, it's not something to take for granted wherever you go. And there's plenty of work to be done to continue to uphold our end of the bargain of taking care of the land. And so with that, I just want to encourage you all to continue to think about the sense of place, the gratitude that you can have for the land in which you're upon, in which you're coming from, not only physically what is it doing for you mentally what is it doing for you spiritually and last night at dinner I was talking with some friends and we were sharing those moments those just beautiful moments that you have of nature guiding you write those down not everybody gets those I have friends who've never seen a deer for me there are a dime a dozen I see them every day on my way to work in town even at that. There's people who've never seen a bald eagle soar over the river and catch a fish. Or who have seen a hummingbird come and land and catch its breath. Or have an owl keep them up all night, cooing away. There's so many uh, things to think about when you acknowledge the land. So I thank, thank you for your time and allowing me to share a little bit of my perspectives and my story. Katsiata.
Thank you so much. That was incredibly powerful. That story reminds me of someone you had on the screen there, a former Headwaters keynote, Robin Kimmer, when she told the story of the Sky Woman, she pointed out that humans show up last. So maybe instead of ecosystem services, they're, they're ecosystem elders. You know, um, the more the human world it would be our elders. And so that was just so powerful. Thank you so much. Um, another round of applause for Stephanie Cowley's. I'd love to call our uh, expert panel on campus attempts at indigenous commitments up to the stage, please. Uh, join me in welcoming Leslie Taylor from Western Colorado University, who will also reflect on Colorado State. Uh, Keely Jock from Paul Smith College. Smith Eldridge will be joining us from University of Utah on Zoom, and Rick Chaboya, uh, who wear many hats, among them uh, adjunct at Apache College and Tutter Institute board member. So come on up and please welcome our panel. Well, thank you all so much for being here. I thought I'd do a little bit differently. I won't do traditional introductions. Let's have you each just sort of introduce yourselves however you'd like to introduce yourself, and it might be fun to give yourself a title. So you can say what your actual role is at your actual institution, but it might be fun to also, you know, if you can make up your own title, what would it be? So um, let's start with you, Leslie. How would you like to introduce yourself? Are you sure you want to know? <laughs> uh, is, is President Baca here? No, he's not here. Go ahead. Go for it. Uh, Hi, I'm Leslie Taylor. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm here at Western Okay. Here at Western Colorado University, I've been here since March. Um, wow, what would I really want to be called if I could pick my own title? I think the uh, initials would be BAE, Badass Extraordinaire. <laughs> Brad's not out there, is he? <laughs> but um, I don't know. If we're just doing introductions, let's go down the line and then I suppose we'll tell our stories later. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Keely Jack. I attend Baltimore College. Um, if I were to use a title, as of right now, I'm just a student, I think. <laughs> She's handing you the mic. I'm going to name you the menu. I'm going to name you the menu. I'm going to introduce myself in my language, Rich Boya. Um, and if I give myself the name, just attempts to live in strength and humility. Beautiful. Uh, and welcome on Zoom, Samantha Eldridge. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Samantha Eldridge. Samantha Eldridge. My Yiddish is Yiddish. Yiddish is Yiddish. My Yiddish is Yiddish. My Yiddish is Yiddish. My I am joining you today from the traditional homelands of the Ute, Paiute, Goshu, and Ute Nation in Salt Lake City, Utah. So um, thank you for welcoming me, a member of the Navajo um, Nation. Wonderful. Welcome. And, and it's wonderful to have you. It's an honor to have you. And um, can you all hear me on this mic? No. Okay, so I'm just going to put this down. What I thought we would do is just go sort of from story to story and thinking about, you know, what might Western have to learn from other campuses who have, you know, attempted um, substantive, collaborative, compelling Indigenous commitments. And so, Leslie, since you're helping me welcome everybody to Western, why don't you start? Uh, six or seven minutes would be great. Okay. <clears throat> I may not go that long, but we'll see. Um, I am a citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. Um, I'm also a descendant of Choctaw and enslaved people who traveled from Georgia, North Carolina, and other areas um, to Oklahoma and Arkansas on the Trail of Tears. 
I think it's interesting a lot of people think about the Trail of Tears as a very specific thing, and it was so much broader. The locations from which people left and where they arrived are very different. Um, I'm also the results of Irish immigrants. So that's my family came together due to forced migration and colonization. Um, my land back, and my work in the land back space began at Colorado State University when I was the vice president for enrollment and access for exactly two weeks. When on our campus, we had a really awful incident of racism in which a parent on a tour with a group of other students um, reported two young Native students who had come up from New Mexico to the police as looking suspicious and looking like they didn't belong. Those students were taken off of the tour by our campus police and spoken to and then allowed to rejoin the tour, but understandably they didn't want to rejoin the tour. They wanted to get out of there. They had already been marginalized, taken off of the tour, and treated terribly. Um, <clears throat> I was in a meeting when all this happened. As soon as I got out of the meeting, people told me about it. I was like, what? You know, ran over to the admissions office. The students had already left and tried to call their mom, couldn't get a hold of her. Um, I tried to warn my colleagues at Colorado State that this was going to be a really big deal. And people didn't believe me. They're like, oh, it's fine. They, they found home. It's going to be fine. And I'm like, it's not going to be fine. And I remember that night I didn't sleep at all. I was super worried because this kind of every identity I have, I'm a mom. Um, I'm a mixed race person. So a lot of times when people see me, they actually think I'm a white woman. I'm Native American. And I have a kid who's about to start looking at colleges. Mm -hmm. And I just, like, everything in me was just torn to pieces by this incident. Sure enough, within about 36 hours, it had blown up on social media. And all of a sudden, people on campus were like, oh, hey, this is a big deal. <laughs> like, I tried to tell you. And um, so I spent kind of the first six months of my career as a vice president dealing with an issue that was tearing me apart inside. And I remember about... I don't know, four or five weeks into it, our president, who literally called me almost every day to check and make sure I was okay, which I greatly appreciated. We were at a cabinet meeting and he said, we are so lucky that you're in this position when this happened. And I said, yeah, you're lucky. It's not great for me. <laughs> and um, I think that was the first time my colleagues ever really thought about how the, that might be impacting me and the trauma that I was dealing with. And, it was super hard. There was a lot of criticism. Um, my name was in the New York Times. It's not how I ever dreamed my name would be in the New York, New York Times or the Washington Post, but it was my unit. Admissions was under my purview, and I was held ultimately responsible for it. Um, as a result of that, though, the president created the Native American Advisory Council, and um, we kind of made the creation of a land acknowledgement statement one of our priorities along with um, the expansion of the tuition program we have, we had a reduced tuition program for Native students who could um, prove lineage or affiliation with any of the tribes that had originally been um, a part of Colorado. So whether it was trade, travel, or residence, there were, I think we included about 200 tribes and nations. It's funny when the state finally got around to doing that same tuition program. They, I think they only included 84. So we had done a lot more exhaustive research. The other things that we worked on were things like reinstatement of a position to recruit transition and work with retention of Native and Indigenous students. And then later, we put to the very top priority creating a vice president for Indigenous Affairs at Colorado State with a significant budget. And the budget we really wanted to come from the land grant income that Colorado State has and continues to has, have as a land grant institution. So I'll do a quick land grant institution thing for you in case you don't know. Um, the Morrill Act established the land grant schools, and a lot of people think the land grants were the land that the schools were built on. No, not at all. There were scripts of property all over the West that were broken up into little chunks. And all the land grant schools got to pick which of those pieces of property they wanted. It was usually about 88,000 acres, I believe. And the reason it was all in the West is because the East had already been stolen and claimed. So, for example, the land that Colorado State University is on was actually granted to Cornell and Ohio State, which I always found that kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. I think I've got that right. I, I could be a little off. 
but only one teeny parcel near Colorado State was actually granted to Colorado State. The school sold that money, put it into endowments, and that's how the schools began. CSU is one of 14 schools that kept some of their scripts. And so we still own a lot of land, and most of it is in um, southwestern Colorado. And a lot of it still creates income for us. It's managed by the state land board. There's grazing on it. There's other rental things. Some of it we only own the, own the, um, the state of Colorado only owns like the surface rights, so mineral rights and things like that. But we really wanted that money to go back to Indigenous and Native Affairs. And just last month, the Board of, the board of Governors of the Colorado State University System voted to put at least $500,000 a year of that money into Indigenous Affairs at CSU. That's not all the money though. <laughs> and we want more. And I also want to um, encourage that group to continue working on how that land is managed. That land currently is managed by the Colorado State Land Board. I have a feeling they don't manage it the same way that Indigenous and Native people do. And the land would be in much better hands if it were managed differently. Um, and all of these things, I can definitely point to areas of success and lots of pain points, but for now, I'll just pass them. <laughs> Uh, so I got this kind of logo, uh, Keely Jack Minkins. Hi, everybody. How are you? My name is Keely Jack. I attend Paul Smith College, and I'm a junior there. And I genuinely think land acknowledgments are really important, and they serve a purpose, and that's to remind everybody who needs it that we are on native land. And so a lot of the work that I do on campus revolves around the First Nations Club. It was newly created, like, we officially made it this semester at the beginning of the fall. <laughs> And we have been working a lot to make sure that the land acknowledgement isn't going in vain, that we are actually doing something about it and that work is continuing after we say it. And so one of our greatest accomplishments this, accomplishment this semester was raising the Haudenosaunee flag. And that is the First Nations flag concerning the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And it is going to stay up now forever. <laughs> There is as a symbol to remind everybody, and as a promise, a physical promise that the institution is making to the Native students and to the Indigenous students, that something will be done to help create a home for them. And it's just a small step, but it's a very, very important one, and it's a very easy one. But it's something that I think that every institution is very capable of doing, as long as you do your research. And it's very easy, and for me, as a Mohawk student that goes to a predominantly white institution, it's comforting to see that my campus is proudly raising my flag and flying it. Mm -hmm. And it just brings me a lot of joy knowing that I have at least that support. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm Kumiai to my mother. Uh, people know Kumiai, our, our land is um, east of, and south of San Diego. And I'm Chicano to my father, who immigrated from Mexico. Um, and um, that's Marianne and Rosario, uh, and they're my, they're all, we're all my strength, and my mother was my teacher um, in so many ways, and uh, I just um, want to thank everybody who organized and, and brought me here. Um, yeah, absolutely, um, and um, I also want to uh, give my thanks and blessings to you, people who uh, have welcomed me into their land, in particular, Regina, who is my primary teacher on this land. And um, it just means a lot to me to be able to travel and to come into to other other indigenous native lands and, and understand who our, our people are and, and what we're doing and the university to sit on this land and what they're trying to do and the work that's being done. And I know here, um, you know, one of the organizers uh, certainly um, has been John, and he's told me a story about he went here as an undergrad um, a few years back, and uh, and it had a really profound impact on him. And uh, a lot of that profound impact came from Native people that he was able to meet while he was here. And he then, over the years, became incredibly you know committed to making changes here, as many of you are doing, right? Um, and I know that there's many there's students here who are who are doing that kind of work. And if it's okay, I'd like. 
whoever is an undergraduate student, whether it be here at Western or in other universities, if you could raise your hand, then I can know who the students are anymore. Right on. Yeah. And then if, if it's possible too, if people who are graduate students, either here or in other schools currently, they could raise their hands. Each other. And that's thank you, and I thank you to you because you have been my guides. You have been my leaders in all the work I've done in 35 years. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about just a couple of examples from a couple of those tools I've been to quite a few and, and had the, the, the opportunity to work at a number of our, our colleges and universities. And I wanna talk about a couple of things we've done to speak to this, this conference, I think, around land back and land acknowledgement. Because what, what, I, what I'm speaking of is the commitment and the responsibilities that universities are making or need to make to indigenous people, right? And to indigenous students in particular. Um, in the places I've, I've, I've worked in the efforts I've, I've been involved with. And the, the first I'll talk about is the first university I worked at was NAU, which was mentioned earlier, um, in, um, in Flagstaff, Arizona. And when I got there, there was a lot of efforts, this is many years ago, 1987, there were a lot of efforts to, to do outreach and bring um, Native students to the campus. And it was often called recruitment, which I knew already was not even the proper way understand their responsibilities to, to Native nations and to Native peoples. And so that was the first thing that we had to start having discussions on. Um, but then specific ways, what I did is I started speaking to students, like the ones who were in this room, undergraduates, graduates, and students who were going to be coming to, or thinking about coming to NAU, and I started talking to them about what are the responsibilities? What, what does it mean for this university to fulfill its commitment and its responsibilities to you as a Native person? And oftentimes there's native people who were on that land, who had spiritual places, who had sacred places all around five state, right? The Navajo, Dene, the Hopi, the Apache from the different tribes, right? And so they would tell me many things and we try to work on all of them, but I'll only talk about two. And the first is we don't come to colleges all the time right out of high school, right? As native people, we come at different times. And I know my mother did. She was a, a domestic laborer for many years, cleaning other people's homes. Cooking for other people, right? Before she can come back to school. And I, knew there's, I know there's a lot of other indigenous native folks who come at different times in their life back to school. And they, you had, I'm serious about this, 35 years ago, they had very little conception of that, right? And then they thought if they brought native students, it was the quote unquote traditional age, 18 year old out of high school. I said, no, that's not our community. That's not our community. You need to understand the diversity of our community in terms of, in terms of age among other, and among, and, and among and a whole lot of other things. So what we came to was one of the things our students needed is family housing because they had children, they had families that they needed to come to school with, right? And so we worked on that. We figured out all the levers of the administration. We figured out we, we, we became students of residence life and that bureaucracy can be so complicated, right? But there's all there's ways in which we can move things forward and collectively we did that. And sure enough, it came about. We, had, we got family housing in NAU that still has become more and more robust and larger. So the families that was primarily in a, in a focus of priority were for native students. And we made sure that people understood that that's something that could be given as a risk and not given, given back, land back, right? Land that could be given back on that campus for native students. So that was one thing. The other was we started caring by, you know, as I, as I conversed with native students, more and more what they would tell me is that we do not understand my responsibilities to my land. To my elders and the fact that I need to go back home with ceremony to fulfill my, my obligations and my responsibilities to my elders. They don't understand that. So, oh, you can't go in. That's during that's during the semester, that's during this. And you know, there, there are all sorts of ways in, um, in which it, it, it interrupted the schedule of, 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 the, of the class, right? So I said, no, you have to understand that you gotta get on native time. You got to get on a native schedule, right? And so we started this campaign among collectively among our uh, all of our students and and and, and our, our our faculty and our and our um, administrators who understood that that needed to be done. We started an educational campaign, both in terms of speaking to faculty in meetings in very personal ways, but also to administrators who start to get the word out in different ways, in policy ways, in ways that, that could start to state change things on a more systemic institutional level, right? Again, over time, over time, it takes relation building. It takes, you know, continuously telling the story and, and making sure that people understand what it means to be native, what it means to have those, 
was, was connected to the land and that they couldn't just leave on the breaks. They couldn't just leave on the holidays because those weren't our holidays, right? Those are those are, there, 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 there was a, we had a completely different you know time you know time scheme you know and so they had to, they had to they had to start adjusting to our time they had to start adjusting to our way of life and the way and the way we interacted with our land and with our elders and with our people and with our children and with our you know with all of our our relatives yeah and so that started happening too as it slowly started moving this this shift they call the university to where it started to become not only something that more and more faculty started to understand and made their own individual policies around it, but they started bringing it to, to their department. And we brought it their, to their department heads and to the deans, and, you know, and to the VPs and so on and so forth. And they started building it into more and more into the policies where it became over time something that they all understood needed to be needed to be really part of part of how they understood how they how they you know led their classes and how they um, how they, they worked with their students. So I felt like, you know, among the many things, I'll jump forward now um, really quickly to another institution. And that's a quite different institution in this land called Ivy Leagues, right? So I started working at Yale. And again, when I first got there, I had to understand from the people who were there, the, what it was to be on their land. Imagine that the people at the Mohegan, the, the Scatico, you know, all the people who were up in Connecticut, right? I spent time building relations with them, following their protocol, building trust, Making sure they understood who I was, making sure that I knew whose land I was on, and, and not not in terms of ownership, but who, who who belonged to that land and how I had to you know move about in that land as as a person from 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 afar, you know. And then and once I came to understand that, along with the time I spent understanding the students who were there, who were a very diverse population of, of indigenous students, native people from from all over the country. In fact, in some cases, all over the world. You know, and they were also visitors on this land. So we had to go out and do do all the connections, all the relation building with, with the Connecticut tribal nations that were there and the people who were there to understand them, to understand who it was that we were, we were working with as, as, as Native people. And then we started to go to work, what do we need to do on campus? And then again, the students spoke to me and said, we need our own space. There's no native space, there's no place we can come together that's our, that's our space, it's our, it's, I like to say, our sovereign space. We can do things that we do and gather as we do and have a ceremony and learn the way we learn and bring bring the people in that we want to have in our in our space. And so we said, so I said, okay, that's what we're gonna work on. We're gonna work on a Native American cultural center, right? And at that time, you get all the same sort of you know administrative pushback and arguments as to not having that, right? Oh, if we give it to you, then everybody's gonna ask for their center. I'm like, that's that's their that's not our issue. You know, it's not our issue as who comes through after us. We're coming to you now as first peoples, right? Uh, as first peoples of this land. And they said, oh, no, that, that separates people. Set of separate people, right? You know, and to, no, that, that, that's not what happens. We, we, gain, we gain more strength. We, we gain a, a better sense of alliance, a better sense of home, and we're more confident. We're actually better able to build relations with people outside of the Native community. So on, so on. I'm sure you all know the kinds of things that, that come up in these kind of discussions. Well, make a long story short, over time, we found not from an administrative standpoint, because they actually wouldn't budge, right? Because if you know anything about Yale, they they, they think they know everything. Right? And, and they move so slowly, you know, because they they they've been around for 300 and some odd years, who knows how long, not nearly as long as we've been around, but they think it's a long time, you know. It's like it's, it's a tiny fraction of the time we've been here, but they think it's a big ass deal. Excuse me. Um, but, 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 but we don't wait for them. We don't have that kind of, we, we knew that we needed to take place. So what we did is work all of us among these ourselves and students, the students led all the, the, the relation building, the facilitation of the discussion among themselves, among other groups that had space already, right? He said, let's share space and name it the Native Center, which is what we did. And we literally put the sign up ourselves. Because I don't believe much in signs, right? But at the same time, sometimes you need that. You need to say, this is ours. We lay claim to this. The same way you did planting your flags, we're planting our flag, right? And so from that, that point, then we realized they had to kick us out then. They had to come, somehow they had to come in and they had to make, they had to, you know, they had to make the statement that you don't belong here, you need to move out. They wouldn't do that. Because Yale won't lose space. There's yeah. nothing about Yale, right? And over time, we got funders, we have developed relations with people who need like money, who are Yale alumni, other possibilities to bring money in to build eventually 
a, a, an independent space, a Native American cultural center, which if you go to Yale, it's there now. There's a gorgeous three-story building where Native students go and, and we do our thing. It's just really pretty amazing. So I'll stop there. Go ahead, Dr. Eldridge. Hi everyone. So just to begin by giving me a little bit of my background. So I grew up in a small rural area on the Navajo Nation in Sanosti, New Mexico, near Shiprock, New Mexico, where many of you are probably familiar with. But, you know, um, grew up with no water, no electricity. Um, our family farmed um, and really just lived off the land. And we never had conversations about going to college or what really having or getting into education met. And um, so it was mostly just like, you know, surviving day by day. And my mom put me in the Indian placement program. And this was the, I was one of the last students part of the Indian placement program where they placed Navajo students with foster homes um, throughout the Wasatch Front. And so that's how I ended up in Salt Lake City. I lived with a foster family. And what was really difficult for me is when I entered the program, I was 12 years old. And as many of you know, middle school was a really difficult time for many of us. And I was still trying to figure out who I was, where I came from, um, still trying to find, understand our culture, our family. And I was always searching for those places where I could see myself or where I belonged. And um, but at the same time, trying to understand and how to incorporate the indigenous side of me. And Dr. Eldridge, my apologies. We just had an audio issue. You paused it for one second. I am so sorry. Okay, it's so okay. important that we hear your story. Thank you. Um, so I was just sharing my experience through middle school and how hard it was for me um, to find those spaces of belonging and really trying to connect with other um native students when there were no native students and there was only a handful of us um in that in our school is are there still problems on your end sorry a little bit yeah we're working on it should i keep talking <laughs> hold on a second please so you make sure just give us one minute we're working on the audio my apologies so important we hear what you're offering. Thank you for waiting. Dr. Eldridge, would you um, do a little audio test for us to say hi? Yeah, I'm um, just testing the audio. Is Much that, better. better. There we go. Yes, thank you. C can, okay. can you? Can you press personal rewind 90 seconds? <laughs> um, I don't so know where, where I stop and don't want to repeat too much, but really, I, you know, the importance of, you know, sharing growing up in a, in a foster family, um, in a, a predominantly white um, school was the difficulty of trying to identify with other students who looked like me when there were no students who looks like me and trying to find those spaces where, you know, I connected and I belonged. And so for me, you know, in thinking about my experience, not just in middle school, but then from there transitioning to higher ed um, and being a first generation low income student, um, the barriers and challenges I had to overcome and trying to navigate this new space um, was really difficult. Um, it took me 10 years to finish my undergrad. And it's because, you know, not just the financial barriers, but commitment to su also supporting my family at the same time. And then just not knowing or taking the right courses and having to retake many of them um, and just in general, not being prepared for higher ed. And so I'm thinking back, um, you know, after, finishing school and where I am today, I want to make the process easier for other students who come from similar backgrounds that I do, that I came from. And um, one of the biggest challenges I've seen is just how, how do we amplify Native voices while we fight invisibility, false narratives, and stereotypes of Native Americans? And I always felt that, you know, since 
I was Native that I had to re represent all Native people. And that's a huge um, undertaking for many of our students. Um, a lot of the responsibility in our educational lies um, in our K through 12 system, but we know that 90% of our schools don't teach about Native Americans past the 1900s. And so um, many of us see us in these historical views or, you know, seeing, seeing a representation of what we look like in media and film. Um, we've seen a resurgence in Rutherford Falls and Reservation Dogs, um, which has been really great in, you know, I, not only identifying with us in media and film, but showing our Native youth um, in positive ways we can represent ourselves. So for the most part, when people see me, they don't see me, but rather some idea of what I am. Um, this means we don't exist. Um, everyone has heard before that invisibility is a modern form of racism against Native Americans. So in thinking about this, this has real consequences when we are left out of key policies that are affect our lives. So, excuse me. So it's critical to ensure we have Native representation, but that we are also amplifying Native voices and hear stories from and about our Native communities. So, you know, just a reminder that you know, when we do land acknowledgements that we are here, we're not invisible, um, but then we're not just your opening and closing to a meeting, um, really looking at us as, um, you know, holding those knowledge, content, and then also providing solutions. And our, I see our connection to the land as weaving us together. And the more we weave together the intersections of our identities and create calls cross-cultural connections, the more we can put action be behind our words. So with this in mind, in September 2020, we created a committee to really think through about establishing an official land acknowledgement. And so um, our land acknowledgement not only recognizes the original people of this land, but it also honors the sovereign relationship that exists with our tribal nations. And I think that's really important as far as recognizing sovereignty, but um, ensuring that tribal consultation happens. And so in anything that we do, we make sure that we have tribal's representation um, at the table. Um, it's also a commitment by our university to serve Native communities throughout Utah. And we do this in uh, partnership with eight tribal, with our eight um, tribes and then our urban Indian communities. Um, so in thinking about how do we move our land acknowledgement, not just to a statement, but more of actionable steps to improve um, our support and resources for Native students, uh, we began asking the question, how do we indigenize the University of Utah? And this really is the platform that describes our efforts to include indigenous knowledge and ways of knowing and being into spaces, programs, daily practices and operations of the institution. And with that, that means here at the center, we're not the only people leading the work that we're really embedding um, these spaces throughout our campus and into the institutional structures um, that support our students. And so it's not just up to us, that it's really a responsibility um, for everyone, um, including faculty, staff, administration on campus and leadership as far as to lead these efforts. And so um, one of the things that we've done as far as best practices here at the AIRC is we've expanded our staff. Um, if you can believe for over 20 years, the center has been led by one person, a director. And so when I um, began this year, one of the first things I um, asked for was increased budget to expand our staff and capacity. And so I think that's huge because now we have, we're able to um, increase our programming. Um, and then we also re-envisioned our mission to not only support students, staff, and faculty on campus, but also to support um, travel advancement and engagement. And so really trying to bring in our tribal leaders and our tribal communities, because uh, many of you know that um, it's really that community um, commitment and reciprocity that, you know, brings us all together. So thinking of how can we um, give back to our community and think it's really important. Um, we've also invited scholars and centered conversations around 
indigenous representation, land back, um, intersectionality of uh, murdered and missing indigenous people. We've had discussions about blood quantum. And then most recently, um, we've discussed the impact of the pending ICWA case before the Supreme Court and really are taking actual steps about, you know, not just to educate our student body, but then also prepare for what happens um, depending on the decision of the Supreme Court, whether it's for or against our community and how um, we support students in, in sort of those social justice movements. So then try to think of proactive ways we can support our students and try not to be less reactive. Um, we've also incorporated the Kairos blanket exercise as a teaching tool. Um, and I don't know if many of you have heard this, uh, the National Indian Education Association leads on some of this work, but it really walks participants through the history and colonization of indigenous people. And what we found what that was really impactful and really important was not only doing that exercise, but also tailoring the script to the regional history of the area. And so um, not just talking about manifest destiny for, and the colonization from the East to the West, but really thinking about our own local history and the impact of Mormon settlement in the area and the displacement of Utah tribes, um, teaching about the Bear River Massacre, where over 400 Shoshone men and women were attacked and killed by the U.S. Army. Um, and then also, you know, the generational trauma that was caused by, by one of our local boarding schools um, in the Inter Intermountain Indian School. And, um, and then also just teaching our own history. The, the center is um, located in Fort Douglas, which of course is a military base and in and of itself has a lot of that history. So I think just also trying to connect back to the land about the impact and making sure that our, our students are supported um, in those ways. And then many of you have probably heard we've launched our Native Student Scholarship. Um, we'll be launching spring semester and this covers tuition and fees for Utah's eight tribal nations. Um, and really just, again, shows our commitment to serving tribal communities by lessening the financial burden. And um, what's, what really takes precedent with this, with this is that we're not a land grant institution. So many of the institutions who are doing the tuition waivers or tuition fee reductions are land grant institutions and receive that funding through the federal government. And so our institution has made a commitment and we're raising those funds through donors because you know, that's just us saying that we value Native students and we really want to support them going to school um, and graduating so that they're able to return to their communities um, to help provide that positive um, feedback. And then um, we've also had a longstanding MOU with the Ute Tribe. We're one of two only higher ed institutions um, who have an agreement to use the Ute name. And we hold a lot of responsibility with that. And we're able to do that through, you know, a genuine respect and understanding of the tribe's history, culture, and ongoing um, tribal consultation. Um, with the U tribe. And so we have regular monthly visits to make sure they're included in a lot of the decision making that we make. And then really with that agreement, again, it's just, you know, us honoring tribal sovereignty and the U tribe giving us permission to use that name. Um, and then one last thing before I end, um, moving forward, not only thinking about how we indigenize our own spaces, but thinking outside the box and looking at out and looking at how we can raise visibility and re representation in non-traditional spaces. And so um, these last couple of months, we partnered with the PAC-12 Impact Initiative, um, and that's their social outreach um, initiative to using sports to promote culture, a culture of diversity and inclusion. And um, we were invited to the PAC-12 championship game um, with USC versus Utah. Um, we did a tribal acknowledgement recognizing the tribes and the tribal regions from the universities that played. Um, and then during the halftime, we recognized the different um, tribal representations um, from three institutions and their centers um, just to acknowledge and recognize the work that they're doing. So 
Um, that's just a little bit of what we're doing. And, you know, just hope that from some of these initiatives that you can, you can get an idea or try to take back to your own spaces. Thank you. Before we take a 10 minute break and then dive into our, our workshop facilitated by Matt Aronson, I wonder if each panelist could just, you know, give a kind of 90 second Folks are about to gather at tables to begin thinking through what would indigenous commitments look like for Western. Um, if you were in their shoes, uh, what's one thing from all of your experiences, what's one thing that would be good for them to know uh, in this sort of beginning for Western? One, one piece of advice as they, they gather uh, for the first time, hopefully uh, only the first time. I think it's really clear, it's really important to know what your intent is in developing land acknowledgement. And then to make sure that your language in the land acknowledgement mirrors your intent. I felt like the one that we ended up with at Colorado State was a bit lengthy. And also the language was a little bit too scholarly. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like um, well, even people described it as, oh, that Indian guilt thing as opposed to what our intention was. Like, I don't feel like we centered people in the land and grounded people in the space that they were. Instead, I felt like it was trying to make almost us and the university feel better about our status as a land-grant institution and the impacts that we would have. Um, I'm gonna offer two things though. Do you need more than one version? You know, do you need a version that is read when there are events on campus, one that perhaps is in literature that explains why you have it a little bit longer, and then something that's shorter for folks who do want to include it in something like an email signature. And again, when folks do that, they need to know what their intent is. What are they saying when they do something like that? And what is their commitment in doing it? Um, I guess that those would be my things. Like, why are you doing it? Does your language and style and the use of the land acknowledgement match what your intent is? I think that's really important. I think I agree um, that your intent is really, really important because you're using it as a sort of commitment to your indigenous peoples. But I also would like to advise all of you that you have to do more than just the land acknowledgement. There are things to do after that. You can't just stop there. You have to continue and be like, what? Do we do now and to continue the conversation because words do only go so far absolutely all, all that and um I, I i live in new york a good part of my time new york city um and i worked in nyu for a number of years and both at the institutions in new york city as well as overall in the institutions throughout new york city land acknowledgements are hot like every museum every cultural institution every university in new york they want to do line acknowledgements now. The first thing we ask them is, what is your commitment and what is your relationship to Native people? And if they can't answer that in a really comprehensive way, they ain't ready. They ain't ready. You gotta first build relations with Native peoples, and then you gotta make commitments and be speaking to the highest level of your institution as to what those commitments are. And my advice to you all would be, as you're developing your land acknowledgement and continue to develop it, be talking to all the leaders on this campus who make decisions about where you'll go from here in terms of your commitment as an institution to Native peoples and, and, and you know, Native knowledge and Native everything associated with that and where they're at with that and, and, their, and their relationship building in a, in a really serious way with, with, with Native peoples, including the Native students here, who are here on campus. Well, I'm not sure if any are in the audience or there any any undergraduate, in particular, any undergraduate Native students in the audience? Because I know there's a, there's a small population of you, right? Here, you need to be talking to Native students who attend Western and talking about what they understand this commitment to be as well, right? As well as Regina and, and, and all the, the youth leaders who are, you know, all, all within the, the, the network of, of and, 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 and the part of this, this land and this institution. You know, you need to be communicating with our advisors to make sure because first thing you'll learn is how small a community it is, a human community it is, and that may be among the first commitments this institution needs to make, right? Is bringing more native indigenous students to this campus. 
And there's a lot of ways to do that. And there's a lot of people doing it and in a lot of ways in which people have found it, it needs to be done, right? So um, it's that's that's what I would say. And also, if you ever want to communicate, I'll say personally with me, no one knows how to get a hold of me. So if anybody, if anything, anybody's, in my case, I can only speak to me personally, anything I've said has picked your interest whatsoever and you want to communicate at some point later, you can talk to John, he'll get you my email. Thanks. Dr. Eldridge? Um, yeah, I, I think just to, um, I think really just adding or sharing that we have two versions. We have a short version and long version. I think that's okay too. Um, and then also um, just reminding everyone that it's not, you know, the responsibility of us as Indigenous people or the Indigenous Center or our tribal liaisons to do the work that we really need to bring leadership into our conversations. Um, it's really important that they hear um, and that they are also part of the conversation so that they can understand the intention and the meaning part of that. And with that, you're not losing the, like I said, the meaning and the intent um, with it just ending up being a statement and nothing more. Let's thank the panel. At five of four, shorter of now, at five of four, uh, Dr. Aronson will run an hour and a half workshop. And then uh, Professor Berman will, will give a kind of closing before we take a break and then uh, hang out with Sacred Stove tonight at 7 p.m. Hi, Connor. <laughs> One thought this panel gave me, think about the difference between strategy and tactics. Strategy is indigenous commitments. Okay, and that could include anything from scholarships to space and centers to commitments to tribal communities. You earn that flag to the relationship with the local tribe tied to even athletics. Um, indigenous commitments is broad as in terms of the strategy. Remember, land acknowledgement is one tactic among countless when it comes to each institution's indigenous commitments. Let's remember that today. You know, um, I love it when things can kind of come full circle in a way that adds complexity rather than a perfect little bow. And we open this event uh, with Regina singing, but also scenery's invitation and poetic blessing. And she's been generous enough to offer us a, a final closing. So let's welcome Professor Scenery Herman back up to the front of the room. Don't you love this time of the day when we stop using the lectern and we're all just casual sitting on the edge of the stage? How are you all doing? Yeah, you feeling energized, a little bit tired? This is hard work. Native people do it every day. So thank you for joining us in it. Um, in 2021, I became the state of Idaho's writer in residence, the first native in the state of Idaho. considering how much of Idaho is comprised of native lands. But that tells you something about Idaho. Um, and the first thing they asked me is if I would write a land acknowledgement <laughs> for them to read. This is what they got. Um, and they've never asked me anything again. <laughs> I hope this um, complicates your thinking. And I hope that in some ways maybe um, validates some of what you're thinking. And I know that some of you read this in Dr. John's classes, um, but I'm, I'm honored to share it with you today. Um, and this was written for where I live. So you'll hear Nimi Pu and Tupidika. Let us pause for a moment and acknowledge the land on which we live. This is the traditional land of the Nimipu and Tukadika. We should take another moment to acknowledge the ways indigenous people have been, are being removed and erased from the land they've cared for for over 16,000 years. Swiftly, brutally, culturally, fatally. Let us acknowledge that soldiers for the United States killed women and children because they were native. 
Let us acknowledge the recentness of this. Let us acknowledge the native people buried in their land without markers, while unnamed settlers rest in fenced graves. Let us acknowledge Indian graves dug up and looted. Let us acknowledge Indian. Let us acknowledge that place names like Squaw Meadows and Dead Indian do not honor our ancestors. Let us take a moment and acknowledge that this land was not stolen from the people whose language, culture, and religion was born of it. Let us acknowledge that the people were stolen from this land. The people who celebrate this land with song, dance, ceremony, people who do not commodify and commercialize trees and water or call it resource. Here we pause to acknowledge that the land itself is rarely acknowledged. The land buried beneath asphalt, concrete, floorboards, and foundations. Let us acknowledge that this buried land, which once grew food and medicine, now grows dollar stores and subdivisions. Let us acknowledge the land, let us acknowledge the land in the way the subdividers do, with the blade of the bulldozer and with names like Forest Trails, Aspen Ridge, River Ranch, with words the way the government recognizes only federally recognized tribes and has taught some natives to recognize others only on paper through blood quantum and CIB instead of commitment to rights and sovereignty. Let us recognize land acknowledgments that serve as consolation, another box checked on a list titled due diligences, the way wearing a Black Lives Matter t-shirt acknowledges white wokeness while the same whites shop at white lives businesses. Acknowledgement as performative allyship. Let us acknowledge that internment camps or prisons. Let us acknowledge the land in the way the spotted knapweed acknowledges it, the way a Ford of sale sign acknowledges it, the way the Forest Service acknowledges the land by stating hashtag it's all yours, but meaning hashtag it's not theirs. This statement acknowledges the land in the same way the media and FBI acknowledge the over 2,000 missing Native women and girls by recognizing the one missing white woman for whom hundreds search and whose picture is present on all our screens, the way Native silhouettes are screened on paper to sell cigarettes. This land acknowledgement is inked on the heartwood of a pine that escaped the fires that fell for the mill from a land that cannot help but acknowledge climate crisis and carrying capacities, the grizzly bear fatally removed and the salmon who can no longer reach their homelands. This land acknowledges the wolves shot by stockmen and sportsmen to preserve the animals stockmen and sportsmen will thenceforth kill in the name of husbandry and sport. Let us acknowledge how we honor loss with dollars and not grief. Let us make depredation of science and pay officers from the Bank of Conservation. Let us acknowledge the words just to disassociate, kill, killer, killing, killed from the act of execution. This land acknowledges that it is recognized for its monetary value, recreational value, and aesthetic value because it too is living. This land recognizes us by our carbon footprint, our clear cuts, our gold mines and our greed. This acknowledges that land back means languages back, means medicine back, means ceremony back, means culture back, means reparations, means all people depend on the land. Let us acknowledge that unless action is taken to identify and empower indigenous peoples, erase an accurate history from every school curriculum, carry out land-based justice and climate change policy, a land acknowledgement is a perfunctory, alienating, and otherwise hollow gesture. Acknowledgement means acceptance, admittance. Acknowledgement is a dead word, is not a verb, is not a deed, does not mean education. Acknowledgement means too late for an apology. Read me your declaration of change. Detail your plan or procedure. Show me your map to equality. And then, maybe then I might be convinced that your land acknowledgement is not but another broken treaty. Yeah, yeah.